On this episode of Shareable Science Beyond the Blog, we're going to talk about risk. Specifically, how we make decisions about the activities that we choose to engage in in the days and weeks ahead. So stay tuned. We'll dig into risk. Welcome to Shareable Science. Science you can share. Over the last several days, we've received a lot of guidance from groups like the CDC and other public health experts on high-risk and low-risk activities, just the kinds of things that we do in everyday life. We're going to walk through that in this video with an analogy that I hope ties it all together. Now, traditionally, it's just me and the trusty whiteboard, but for this video, I've brought a set of props. So let's get started with these jars. Now, the jar represents your exposure allotment, your risk allotment for a 10 to 14 day window. So you can think about this as all the activities that potentially bring you into contact with an infected person. And the first question is, how big is the jar? And there are three key things that influence the size of the jar, and I've listed them here. So the first is your own personal status, your own level of risks. We know age, gender, Underlying risk factors like obesity and diabetes and ethnicity, those are all things that influence an individual's risk that if they get infected, they will have a more severe set of symptoms. If you have those higher risk pieces, your exposure jar is smaller in order to reduce your overall risk. If you have someone in your household who falls into those categories, then your exposure jar is likely going to be smaller because you are trying to reduce the likelihood that you bring the virus home to that individual. But then there's another set of circumstances that are beyond information about you and the people in your household that influence how much exposure you can pack in in a two-week period. And that's what's, the ha what's happening to the virus in your community. And there are two key things here that you want to look at. The first is the percent of positive COVID-19 tests in your region. And you can find this information on your state's Department of Health websites or on other COVID-19 trackers. If possible, you want to see what the positive percentage is in your area, your county, the counties around you, not just the entire state, because things can vary widely from one end of a state to another. In general, positive percents below 5% are relatively low risk. Below 2% is even better. So you want to pay attention to that. When those risks, those positive percents climb, it means that your exposure jar has gotten smaller because the external likelihood that you're going to cross paths with the virus just in your everyday interaction in your community is already higher. You also want to pay attention to the trend line in terms of the number of new cases. When that's stable or dropping, that means, again, the likelihood that you're going to encounter it in your community is falling. But when those new case lines begin to increase, you need to increase your caution and think about a smaller exposure jar for yourself. Okay, that gives us some background on the jars. Now let's talk about the risks from the activities that we actually fill the jar with. All right, let's start with this fact. Keeping the lid on the jar and not having any risky activities is the best way to keep your risk low. But that comes at an enormous cost, emotionally, mentally, economically. Even the most dedicated introvert, quarantine long-term is not beneficial for their own well-being. So at some point, we got to put some activities in the jar. There are four key things that you want to pay attention to as you think about the overall risk for that activity. And we've talked about these before. The amount of time that you're actually doing the risk activity, how much space you've got between yourself and somebody else, the number of people that are also doing the activity with you, and if it's taking place inside, outside, or in a well-ventilated space. Here are the key factors. In the ideal setting, something that is relatively short, where you have a lot of space with a small number of people outdoors is your lowest risk. On the flip side, something that takes a really long period of time where you are right up against knee to knee with somebody with a big crowd and you are in an enclosed space, that's at your highest level of risk. 
So with that in mind, let's now talk through some of the different risks that you and I might be thinking about taking in our everyday life. Let's start with outdoor activities. So my morning walk or jog, which is really more a walk, not a jog, um, but that is a relatively low set of activities. I can do that every single day. I can put a lot of those in my jar. That has very little risk. Spending the day at the beach or the pool or the park is also a low risk, especially if you can keep six feet of distance between your family and anybody else. There's a little bit of risk because you're touching common things that other people might have touched like gates and things, but overall pretty low risk. Your weekly trip to the grocery store, also low risk if you are practicing appropriate physical distancing and you're wearing a mask. It's a big open space. It's not a, tie, it's not a zero risk, but it's a small risk. Okay, now let's talk about going to a restaurant. And that's where these things come into place. I'm getting together with two or three friends at an outdoor cafe for a relatively quick meal. And we've got enough space in our outdoor booth. I'm getting together with 20 people inside for a three course smorgasbord and we are sitting knee to knee. You choose. There's a whole range of risk factors in there in going out to a restaurant. And you've got to make the decision about which of these you're going to do. Getting your hair cut or going to the salon. This has a higher risk. This is a moderately risky activity because there is a longer window of face-to-face -face contact. But you can reduce that risk if you're not sitting in a common waiting area, if you're wearing appropriate protective gear and so is the person that, um, that you, uh, is, is your hairdresser or doing your nails, and if you cut the chit chat. This is a time just to get down to business, not to catch up with them. There will be times to do that later on. Okay, what about an indoor gathering with dozens of people? Maybe this is a, a large meeting or a worship service or a celebration or a party. These are important life moments, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't do them. But when we gather in these kinds of ways with people that we are routinely used to being together with, we often greet them with hugs and handshakes and pats on the back. We often stand closer than six feet apart because we're so happy to see them and we celebrate. Those are all high-risk activities. Again, I'm not saying don't do it. It's your choice but you need to know the significant risk that you step into with that. Okay, what about a concert or a sporting event or a political rally or a big outdoor celebration or an indoor celebration? At that moment, getting together with a lot of people where you are yelling and cheering for an extended period of time, this pretty much blows your entire exposure budget for your 10 day window. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but look for ways to reduce your risk. Wear a face covering, try to keep your distance. Think about being there for a shorter period of time, or maybe decide that while you love to do this, it's not worth the exposure right now. And if you've got all these other activities going on in this same two week window, you are well over your exposure budget. You have put yourself at a high risk of running into somebody who might also be infectious and can pass it on. One more thing that you need to think about, and that's the people that you are spending time with doing these other activities. Are you getting together with a friend who practices a whole lot of physical distancing, wears a face covering, and doesn't go out in large crowds? Or are you hanging out with somebody that just got back from an incredible indoor concert, has gone to four weddings and a funeral, and is headed to a giant sporting event? Those are huge differences in the exposure that they are bringing into your life. And you just need, to, again, to think about and be aware of that. All right. Lastly, you want to plan your exposure in three to four week sweeps. So that if there's a big event that you want to go to that has a higher exposure, in the days leading up to it, you are minimizing your exposure. And on the flip side, once you've done that big event, the next 10 to 12 to 14 days, 
you have a lower set of activities. You want to think about, number one, before I go to this event, how do I minimize the likelihood I am going to be unknowingly infected and share it at that big event? And then after the event, I was at an event with a whole lot of people who could have been infectious. How do I minimize the likelihood that if I am infectious, I pass it on to other people? This is the same kind of decision-making process that we go through when we decide to budget and save for something big, some big expense, and I forgo smaller expenses, or that you and I go through when we decide that we're gonna change our diet and we're gonna say no to certain things in order to say yes to others. We're gonna be doing this for a while, so I want you to begin thinking in this kind of overall exposure risk mindset. It doesn't mean we can't have great experiences. We just have to be intentional and we have to make trade-offs for the things that are most important for us in that window of time. I hope you find this useful. Please share this with other people that you think might also benefit from thinking about risk exposure in this way. Thank you for watching the video. I look forward to seeing you again on the next Shareable Science Beyond the Blog. Take care.